uh, he, he was a silversmith, uh, an artisan, and he also worked for the Committee of Correspondence delivering messages. And so did William Dawes, who was another guy from Boston. And Joseph Warren, the, really the leader of the Provincial Congress in Massachusetts, and one of the most important figures in Massachusetts politics, realized that the British were up to something, that they were planning some kind of an operation to go out and seize the gunpowder being held out in Concord. And so Warren wanted to get the word out to the committees of safety and the other communities so that they could be on alert. So he finds these two messengers, Revere and Dawes, and sends two out in case one gets captured. Now, the only way to get out of Boston is either by rowing across Boston Harbor to Charlestown or across the Charles River or by land along Boston Neck. So Revere is going to row across Boston Harbor to Charlestown, and then Dawes is going to make it, if he can make it through the British sentries on Boston Neck, he will go by way of Roxbury and Brookline into Cambridge and then out that way. And what they're doing then is going, they're, they're not riding through the streets yelling, the British are coming, uh, first because they're British too, uh, and if you're trying to do something without being captured, since there are British sentries out, you're not going to go around yelling this. What they do is they know whose house to go to. They know who is the leader of the committee of safety. Uh, they know who is the leader of the local militia. They know who is on their side, and they knock on a window and tell them the regulars are out. Because now they know where the regulars are going, and that's kind of shrouded in mystery how Warren had found this out. And, you know, the legend is that um, one if by land, two if by sea, by sea actually is by way of the Charles River, and uh, Robert Newman had flickered this signal from the North Church or the Christ Church spire so that they knew the British are leaving, going across, going, marching from Boston Common, getting into boats, going across the Back Bay and Charles River to Cambridge, and then marching out. And meanwhile, Revere and Dawes are alerting these other communities, and then other riders are going out. And they're also... Um, one signal, if you're in one of these towns, and signal that something is afoot, is to ring the church bell. So the church bells start ringing. In fact, as the British soldiers are marching through Cambridge and what's now Arlington very early in the morning of April the 19th, they hear church bells ringing in the distance. They realize that the signal has been given. And it's a near dawn when these troops reach the town of Lexington, and the Lexington militia by this time is convened on Lexington Green. And there's a face-off between the British soldiers and the Lexington militia. And the British officer orders the militia to disperse. And according to the legend, um, Captain Parker tells his men to hold their fire. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And then someone fires a pistol from somewhere. And each side thinks they're being fired upon. The British open fire, and that leaves about an eight or a dozen of the militiamen dead on Lexington Common. And then the British soldiers simply march on, because this wasn't their objective. Their objective was Concord, to get the weapons being stockpiled in Concord. And General Gage had been collect confiscating weapons, or trying to confiscate weapons, since the previous year. In December, he had sent a force up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to confiscate weapons, had not been successful in doing so because, again, Revere had alerted the Portsmouth militia that this was afoot. Another expedition had gone to Salem, and that also was thwarted by the folks in Salem. And the rumor had spread through Cambridge that um, Gage was sending troops to Cambridge. This is in September of 1774, and the mob in Cambridge can't find any soldiers, but they attack the loyalists in town and drive them out of town. So you had had these skirmishes before this. And what happens then at Lexington and Concord, you know, is first at Lexington, the British open fire and then move on to Concord. At Concord, they do find the weapons. They start burning, have a big bonfire in front of the meeting house, practically puts the meeting house on fire. Soldiers help the townspeople put the fire out. Meanwhile, another expedition has gone north of town, and at the North Bridge over the Concord River, they see across the bridge the militia of Concord is massing, as well as militia from Bedford and other nearby towns. That is, all night the word has been going out, and now militia troops are converging on the area. 
and they're on this hill just beyond the Concord River. And what they see across the river, British unit, and beyond them, smoke rising from Concord. They think the British have set the town on fire. So the militia at the North Bridge stand their ground. And the British force, there's a skirmish at the North Bridge. And then the British force, having completed its mission, there's no reason now to go and attack this militia on the other side of the bridge. They turn back. Well, this militia force sees the British now turning around, and they think we've made them retreat. So they start following them. And now more militia troops are converging from throughout New England and coming onto the scene as this British army is now retreating back to Boston. And now the real battle begins as through this 20 mile march, the British are harassed by the fire, the militia fire. And by the end of the day, the British army is concentrated safely back in Boston for the most part. They've suffered some casualties, but now they have 20,000 militia troops surrounding them. So what happens at Lexington and Concord is this, um, well, as Ralph Waldo Emerson called it, the shot heard round the world, you know, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The foe long since in silence slept, the conqueror too in silence sleeps, and time the ruined bridge has swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. By this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone that memory may their deed redeem when, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit who bid these heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. You know, Emerson's poem is about a lot of things. It's not necessarily about what happened at Concord. It's about this spirit, this emanation from it, these heroes who dared to die and leave their children free, and about time sweeping all of this away, the ruined bridge down this dark stream which seaward creeps, and thinking about a time when, you know, Emerson's writing this in the 1830s. His father lived just near the bridge and was there that day, and his father is gone, and Emerson's sons will be gone but we want this remembered, so we set a votive stone here so that this will be remembered. And so it's a powerful image of what happens, but again, it's not necessarily exactly what happened. We were, it's hard to get into the minds of these folks who were standing at the bridge. We do know that at the end of the day, the British Army is concentrated in Boston, surrounded by 20,000 militia troops, and then there's the big question, what happens next. And if you read the press accounts at the time, it's this skirmish by the ministerial troops, not really thinking this is the first shot of the American Revolution or a war for independence. Instead, it's we're not quite sure what this is. And the newspapers help us to make sense of how these folks were making sense of these extraordinary events in April of 1775.